Woe be unto him who opens one of the seven gateways to hell, because through that gateway, evil will invade the world.
All right, guys, we're here to talk about a very special movie, 1981's Burial Ground. And I got two very special guests, two experts on it. They're doing a lot of heavy lifting on this episode. We have Art Editor, editor of Ultraviolet Magazine. How's it going, Art? It's going well. And we also have Bruce Holchek. He runs the blog Cinema Arcania. Both these guys contribute to a lot of supplemental material on DVDs and Blu-rays, and they're pretty much experts in the horror and grindhouse kind of subgenres for sure. Yeah, How's thanks for person? having us. I, uh, I'm i definitely happy to be here. Uh, finally put it on record uh, some talk about my role as professor in Burial Ground. <laughs> you do have that look. Yeah. and um, I'm you your know. friend. I was waiting for it. I'm your friend. No, I'm your friend. <laughs> um, this movie has been infamously called So Bad It's Good. I'm going to push back and say So Weird It's Good. Uh, this is a bizarre movie, right? It's equal parts silly, cheesy, creepy, and and actually kind of off-putting. And that's what makes it kind of a special, unique Euro zombie film. Um, 1981 was a big heyday, right? After Dawn of the Dead, zombie, we got a lot of them. But this is probably one of the last ones that uh, kind of fits that mold, and honestly, in that kind of weird vein. So uh, when, when did you guys first see this movie? Any early kind of attachments of your history and everything like that? Uh, do you want to go first, start? I would be happy to go first. So, as is well documented, I was a child of the VHS heyday, as was Mr. Holacek. And uh, in 1985, my family, we got our first VCR. The movie Burial Ground played U.S. theaters pretty widely. And in my hometown of Buffalo, New York... I saw the newspaper ad mat for it in 1985. I actually still have the actual newspaper from 1985 with the ad mat. And Burial Ground played not some sleazy little grindhouse. It played an AMC chain theater or a general cinema chain theater as well as a drive-in. And the artwork that later showed up on the video box, the US one sheet, really captivated me. It was the year before. I started going to see every horror movie that played theaters in 1985. I wasn't quite doing that yet. I was 10, and my dad took me to see Friday the 13th Part 6 and Psycho 3 that summer. But it wasn't until Witchboard, um, a little into the sixth grade, that I started going to R-rated horror movies without a parent. Not that this was R-rated. This was released unrated, which, of course, was one of the things that appealed to me about the ad mat now very um shortly after that in late february of 1986 burial ground hit video and this was not a hard to find videotape mm -hmm. burial ground was released by vestron video and later on we can talk about vestron video uh there's it's a very interesting company but you know this was the year before they hit it big with dirty dancing and their tapes were everywhere and burial ground was everywhere you could rent videos so i was just going through the horror section and i'd started watching italian horror started watching argento movies fulci movies but this one as soon as i saw it in the video store i had remembered it from that newspaper ad in fact when i was visiting a family member in bucks county outside of philadelphia my aunt was like i have to go return some videos who wants to go with me and me being the video nerd I was, I was like, hell yeah. And we went into this big video store in suburban Philly. I remember what it looked like. It had this like step down sort of stage area. And we went and they had just this big poster promoting that burial ground was a hot new rental. And I'm thinking as soon as I get back to Buffalo, I'm going to rent burial ground. And of course, you know, now we've all seen that one of the cool promotional tie-in items Vestron had was this little pad of paper with a pencil with a shovel at the end of it yeah. to, to promote the movie. But anyway, I rented it then, and, um, you know, I was 11 years old in 1986, and the movie just blew my mind. I mean, um, you know, I was already a fan of the off-kilter Italian dubbing. Um, unlike some of the Argento and Fulci movies, that are maybe, you know, shot in scope and um, looked really ridiculous because of how cropped they were on VHS. Burial Ground is shot in 16 millimeter and is 166 to one. So you're really, you're not losing 
a ton of information. Yeah, the tape was dark, and you can hear people talk about how horrible the quality of it was. It really wasn't that bad, and it was uncut, and it's a super crazy movie, which we'll get to momentarily, but that's my um, brief, not so brief answer as to when I first saw it, and like, it was an unforgettable experience, hilarious movie, wild movie, and I just adore it. It's, um, it's my favorite zombie movie of all time, and its detractors can go fuck themselves. <laughs> like, how, like how you can call yourself a, a Euro cinema, Euro sleeves, Euro whatever fan and say anything negative about Burial Ground is beyond me. It's just like a joy to watch Burial Ground and the new edition that just came out. And I can go on and on, but um, I will I will pass the torch to one of one of you now. Yeah, so my first time seeing it uh, was on video uh, in the early 90s. I had kind of, I had seen Zombie a little bit earlier, and that sort of opened these, you know, sort of like new floodgates to me where I was interested in just the goriest of the gory. Uh, and that's around the time that I also found out about uh, Chaz Balance, the Gore Score books. Uh, so I picked up the Gore Score and the Deep Red Horror Handbook and all that stuff, and immediately just like hand wrote lists on notepaper of everything that had a 10 on the gore score, everything that had a nine on the gore score, everything that had an eight on the gore score. And I pretty much just made those priorities. Uh, and I would do whatever I could, you know, to try to see these movies, you know, renting them out at, you know, multiple local video stores, you know, at the time, you know, I, I, I couldn't drive yet. So I was pretty much limited to where my parents were willing to drive me to. Um, but thankfully, like Art said, uh, the burial ground tape was pretty much at every video store you would go to. It was a very widely distributed tape. Um, so with with burial ground getting a, a ten on the gore score, you know, I uh, immediately rented it pretty much the next day after getting that book because I had recognized the title from the box on the shelf uh, at the local uh, video shop. Um, so yeah, rented it. Uh, absolutely loved it because you know, like you said, Dave, it's it's just such a weird little movie that you kind of can't help but fall under its spell um it's you know we'll get into it a little bit uh you want to talk about the script but it, it's such a meat and potatoes concept it's like there's no fat it just goes from point a to point b and then it ends uh so yeah and i and i do think you're right that there does seem to be kind of a cult that has sort of latched onto it for the wrong reasons you know a lot of people are you know, oh, this cloth smells of death, ha 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 ha, and like laughing at the movie and not laughing with its ridiculousness. Um, and I really kind of do think that's the wrong attitude because it really is kind of a nightmarish, relentless film, uh, and it really is crazy. Uh, and I, I definitely think that having that sort of attitude about it is kind of condescending to the actual film itself. I think it's much better than it's given credit for. Yeah, I would agree. Um, this one is one that, uh, you know, I, I watched a lot of movies growing up, Universal Horror, really young age. My mm -hmm. grandpa used to record stuff and bring it down. So he'd bring tapes and tapes and tapes, and I'd watch, my family would watch them voraciously. And when we got to Night of Living Dead was a tape I had in the house, and I loved that movie. So I would be talking to my mom's, um, my friend's mom, and she was like, well, have you seen Dawn of the Dead and Day of the Dead? So I was like, no. And I was only about eight or nine. So I went and tracked down Day of the Dead they had at the video store. Fell in love with it. Could not find fucking Dawn of the Dead at the local video store. So we go into three or four. Finally saw Dawn of the Dead. My zombie appetite was in full swing. So then I started looking everywhere for zombie films. And one of the first ones I saw at another video store was Burial Ground. Mm -hmm. Along with Night of the uh, the Night of the Zombies, the uh, Bruno Matai film. And City of the Living Dead. Um, and all three, uh, Gates of Hell, it was on right. VHS. And all three of them have this zombie on the front that's like and it kind of <laughs> looks similar right. and i was just like i read it all those and i, I watched those a lot I, immediately even at a at 10 years old you're like night of the zombies you're like this is a fucking ripoff like at 10 you know <laughs> <laughs> like shameless so but burial ground was one just this bizarre film and i like that one and i think the fourth one i saw would have been city of the walking dead which is technically nightmare city right which is a not a zombie movie even though they get shot and they're still running at you so they're fucking dead at this point Lindsay. I don't know who wrote your movie, but they're fucking dead. Right. Um, but, um, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> sort of. But, uh, yeah, so this one was just a weird, bizarre experience I had. I probably, I don't remember if I recorded it. I had the Vestron tape. It was a, I, my, mine was cut. But red red VHS cover on the side. Never forget it with the white Vestron logo, right? You got it, Art? Yeah. There it is. There it's it like, is. Um, 
And what's great, like I showed you on another episode, it's from my childhood video chain of Video Factory, which makes it mean all the world to me because that's where I rented. One of the things about this tape, too, is I love movies. I had a friend who pointed this out back in the day when there were no stills on the back. Like, it's like, oh, there was nothing suitable. The label just fell off. You might have seen that. <laughs> Where it's like, oh, we have no, we have nothing suitable. So it's just text and like a little drawing. Neon Maniacs. To... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not, not the House on the, the Edge back. of the Park. Look, the label. The you just witnessed the, the Vestron label <laughs> just falling it's a, off. It's a bootleg. You printed that oh. yourself. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> it is, it is not. This is the weight of this thing. This is not a bootleg. <laughs> this is not a bootleg. But um, anyway. It's funny um, you mentioned the Night of the Zombies tape uh, with you know, Bruno Mattei's Hell of the Living Dead uh, because I was absolutely fascinated with that movie, uh, the idea of that movie growing up. Uh, my local movie theater had their walls wallpapered with movie posters. And most of them were just generic Hollywood things. But for some reason, they had Night of the Zombies as one of the posters that was used to wallpaper their... Uh, their walls, their hallways, uh, leading you back to the theaters. Uh, so I was absolutely fascinated with the idea of that movie. I mean, it's such a great cover art. Um, and I remember picking it up at the, the rental shop, but my mom wouldn't let me rent it uh, at the time uh, for some reason, probably because it had, you know, a zombie on the back and it had a rated R or whatever. Uh, so eventually I did uh, end up buying that from a video store that was selling off their tapes, having not seen it prior. And I picked up my first tapes of Evil Dead 1, Evil Dead 2, Dawn of the Dead, and Night of the Zombies. And going, you know, I'd seen the other three already, you know, all three classics in their in their own way. Art might disagree, but whatever. Uh, but then watching Night of the Zombies, I was like not prepared for Italian uh, zombie exploitation at that time. Uh, and yeah, I just thought Night of the Zombies was like the worst fucking movie. It took me years to come back around on Night of the Zombies. Uh, well, just from and, that. Yeah, like th this movie, Burial Ground, like this is exactly what I like about Italian genre cinema. Like if I were to try to explain to someone why I love the goofy dubbing, why, like this is the movie to show people. And right. if they can't connect with it or they think it's stupid, or, then it's just not for them. Like, like do not do a deep dive into Italian genre cinema if... um if you can't hang with burial ground you know and all these imbeciles who act like the cinema of dario argento is like so serious it's like have you heard some of the dialogue in those yeah, movies right. it's like absurd right but um i would never watch this movie in italian I mean, of course i have watched it in italian and um it's still goofy but it's like i i will concede that a lot of the actors are speaking italian not all of them some of them seem to almost be speaking gibberish i can't tell what their lips are doing <laughs> But they're like, um, but they're, they're just they're, counting, right? Yeah, they're certainly not saying like the lines from the movie in any discernible language. <laughs> but, um, you know, a lot of our favorite movies are in English. Um, our favorite Italian movies are in English. This one is probably mainly not, if at all. But um, so well. I, I do want to talk about Italian films in general, kind of the, uh, put where Burial Ground came from in a little bit of context. Um, Fellini, it comes from, of course, uh, obviously. Uh, so. As we all know, uh, Italian cinema kind of tends to go in cycles, in genre trends. Um, like in the 60s, you had, you know, the Peplums and the Spaghetti Westerns and the James Bond knockoffs. Uh, the 70s were kind of overrun with Gialli and Poliziotesky films. Um, by the time they got to the 80s, however, it seemed like the trends were getting a little bit shorter. Like those other genres literally had dozens, if not hundreds of titles. Uh, to them, but by the time the 80s came around, uh, Italian cinema was really kind of in a weird spot. Uh, more people were staying home and watching television, so uh, theatrical numbers weren't as high as they were previously, um, and some of that can be credited to just the fact that crime was running rampant in Italy. You know, you watch all these uh, 70s Italian cop thrillers and they're full of like kidnappings and robberies and it's it's easy to forget that that stuff was actually kind of happening. Um, Political turmoil too. I mean, there was right. like yeah. threat of bombings and... Mm -hmm. Their, their so president was assassinated by a terrorist organization. It doesn't get much <laughs> crazier than that. Right. Know? So yeah, a lot of people were honestly just, uh, uh, you know, afraid to leave their houses. Um, so, you know, you kind of saw... Italian cinema become less worried about their 
own market and you know while there always were making films with hopes of exporting as well um they really kind of started to jump on trends and look at what they could really make a quick profit off of as compared to just releasing uh locally so one of the uh, genres that kind of jumped into production were as you know they they were uh called in the fanzine scene at the time you know the pasta land chunk blowers where it was kind of like this weird run of italian cannibal and italian zombie movies um and the, the impetus behind that was kind of twofold one you had dario argento working you know uh on his own version of george romero's dawn of the dead for the italian audiences uh at the time argento was really kind of a big deal you know he was kind of like in a league of his own um he was kind of seen as like the face of italian horror at the time you know he had his face was on his television series uh deep red was a huge hit uh critically and commercially as was suspiria so when dawn of the dead came out you know they were his was the first name on the poster you know dario argento presents so that was kind of seen as a big deal and that was, of course was a, a big hit in italy um but as a follow-up to that and probably more importantly was uh fabrizio de angelis producing lucio fulci zombie uh which again was a huge success worldwide you know they really cleaned up with that on the international market uh and the success of that kind of made some of these other smaller producers uh kind of sit up and go oh well you know we could be successful in the international market too you know it is possible for an italian movie like this to really uh uh do well at the you know an international level um, the timing of it was breakneck too, just like yeah. American exploitation. I mean, we're talking seventy-eight Dawn of the Dead, and then seventy-nine Zombie and Burial Ground going to production. Right? I mm -hmm. mean, it's fast, right? It's not like they're taking their time to see how this trend pans out. Right, they're, right. Let's and, do this. And the eighties were really like that. I mean, you know, it's the cannibal zombie trend really only lasted. A few years. You know, yeah, yeah, I mean, nineteen eighty get... has over twenty, like, or something along those lines in Italian. Nineteen eighty is the king of it for right. Italian zombie and cannibal films, right? You name and them. and then like not, you know, within the next year they were moving on to sort of these post nuke, Road Warrior ripoffs and all these like uh, Conan inspired sword and sorcery movies, uh, and you know the cannibal zombie stuff was left behind. Um, but it does seem like the cannibal zombie stuff was the genre of choice for the fanzines uh that we were reading you know in the, in yeah. the 90s um and probably just because they were so gory and kind of like crass and boundary pushing um as compared to you know earlier italian stuff it's funny because you think of there being a thing uh, you think of italian horror being a thing but honestly before this period, there wasn't a ton of Italian, like modern Italian horror movies. A lot of their stuff was more like gothic chillers. Um, and then, you know, some people classify all the Jali as uh, horror movies, but Italy considered them thrillers. You know, they, they considered right, but them. The, but the fact that they were so gory, like that's where it like connects to the international gore boom and the international like horror market is like they were so explicit in, in ways that that like thrillers weren't in the states you know mm -hmm. and, and it, that it varies varies movie to movie for me mm -hmm. of, like, course, of course solange is a horror film what have you done to solange is 100 percent right. a horror film well something like black belly the tarantula you'd be like kinda maybe who cares right. you know yeah, and so, something like torso definitely you know with its horror sadism film. kind of right goes goes the hard uh lines and you you know it's some of that stuff did kind of cross pollinate too um like you mentioned Solange, but you know, also, uh, what have they done to your daughters? You know, there's some gore in that. Um, and even, uh, uh, uh Rico the Mean Machine, you know, Polizio Tesco was, it was so violent that it was actually released as a horror movie in the U.S. It was promoted as the Cauldron of Death, um, just because That's it was a Spanish you know, movie, though, isn't it? Uh, it's, it's directed by Italian. I think it's the Spanish culprit. I don't know. Well, a lot. Mo 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 most of them were uh, Spanish co-productions. Yeah, Sleeping yeah. Corpses Lie is a Spanish-Italian co-production too, so that one gets iffy. But I would, always, I always thought it was mostly Spanish. Well, and it's funny because you know I, I go into that a bit on the commentary of uh, uh, Let Sleeping Corpses Lie yeah. or Living, Living Dead Manchester Morgue, whatever you want to call it. Um, the main, uh, you know, the the main driving force behind 
Living Dead Manchester Morgue was the Italians. You know, it was yep. Edmondo Amati. Uh, and it was his deal. It was his idea. He got the script written. Uh, he was the one who, you know, had the financing. He found the Spanish co-financiers. Uh, so I actually do consider that an Italian production, although most people want to consider it Spanish horror because it's, you know, directed by Jordi Grau. Um, but, yeah, it's like a lot of these things kind of roll over into a little bit of a gray area. Uh, and even, you know, it's funny, you know, that movie does even feel to me more Spanish than anything Italian at the time. Um, but yeah, so in the 70s, but, you know, besides the Jalo, uh, you know, you had, you had some Exorcist ripoffs, um, and you had Suspiria, but really, it, like, uh, Italian horror, as far as anything like supernatural or monster related or anything like that, you didn't really have a lot of that, um, until, you know, really the 80s kind of, like, picked up, it was like post-zombie where they started, you know, kind of running at that, you know, really hard. One of the, um, like, reasons that I think Chaz, Deep Red, Fangoria, and the, um, the fanzines and magazines were latching on to these movies is because it was really exciting that they were playing stateside, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, if you were of age, you saw a zombie in the theater, you saw House by the Cemetery, Burial Ground, the ones that got significant releases, and if you lived in a big enough city, maybe you saw additional titles as well. But, um, you know, that had to be an exciting time for an adventurous gorehound, I would think, to be able to see, like, you know, pieces at your local multiplex, right? Like, um... Well, like, and, even, and even if they didn't play, I mean, the, the turnaround on video wasn't that came long. Right so. out. They came right yeah. out. Yeah. So, I and mean, really... a lot of them were, like, for every one that was butchered, a lot of them were. On, I mean, pieces, right. burial, some of our favorites, we just, we saw basically complete versions, you know? Right. Dr. Butcher MD. I mean, sure. you know, yeah, yeah, all that stuff. Zombie was uncut. Right. As far as I saw it, it yeah, was yeah. uncut. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which, which, you know, made it a lot easier. Uh, and especially, you know, people like me who were, you know, I was probably too young for most of these things in theaters. Um, Same. But, yeah, I mean, having a, a well-stocked local mom-and-pop video shop uh, really made all the difference when you started diving into these films because there was so much right there. Uh, well, I was right on the cusp of, like, understanding of, like, you, bought, you read them at the video store when you're super young, but then the internet kind of was introduced when I was 15, 16, so I started learning about Uncut. So mm-hmm. I wouldn't even try to watch them if they were cut. I'd avoid them like the plague. Right. So then I try, try to find everything on cut. So a lot of the ones I saw for the first time were on cut. And it's funny because some of the bigger titles, the ones that were the, I guess, the catalyst for these genres were harder to find. Uh, Holocaust was hard as hell to find when you're 15 in like, what, uh, 19, in 2001. It was not an easy film to track down if you're a 15 year old kid. You know? Yeah, in the, in the 90s, I remember calling around to video stores, basically every video store I could find in the phone book, uh, which is an old man saying if ever there was one, uh, and just calling these places and being like, "Do you have Cannibal Holocaust? Do you have Necromantic?" You know, and, and like everybody would be like, "What?" Uh, and then finally, I did it too. <laughs> yeah, uh, finally, weirdly enough, I found a store about 15 minutes from me that actually had Necromantic. Uh, they had bought it and Der Todes King, and they never put them out because I guess they watched them after they bought them. They're like, no, and they like literally just sold them off to me for fifteen bucks each, just because they were nice. like, we don't we don't know what to do with these. Cannibal Holocaust was a little different. I actually found a place. Uh, Leonard Maltin's movie guide had a advertisement in the back for a place called Video Vault in Alexandria, Virginia, and they did mail orders by they, they did rentals by mail order, um, and their slogan was guaranteed worst movies in town. And I remember calling them and asking them if they had Cannibal Holocaust. And they were like, yes. And I'm like, holy shit, I found it. You know, it was like striking gold. Uh, you know, I, I couldn't believe it. Uh, so, yeah, I like baked my mom to uh, get me a membership uh, to this place and like, you let her use the credit card so that I could rent, you know, movies by mail from this place. Uh, so, yeah, I remember getting like that, the Beyond. And I think actually uh, Leslie from Corpses Lie. But I think that was my first batch. It's a great uh, batch. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah, weird. I walked into Kim's. Um, you know, my mom's entire family lives in New York City, and I would go into the village, take the A train down to Washington Square, walk up to St. Mark's Place, went to Kim's video, and all these movies that I had always wanted to see that weren't available legit in the U.S. or were like something like the film threat necromantic tape, they just had them all for rent. You know, right. they're just sitting there for rent. 
Frank Cannibal Hulk, and I was just, my mind was blown. I didn't do that, I just ended up getting those movies when I started tape trading. But the first time I saw those movies, like, on a shelf, available to rent, it just, like, blew my mind um, that there were people who had access to that. Because I had access to incredible things. I didn't realize that renting Last House on Dead End Street wasn't so easy to do, because it was right there in this mainstream, well-lit commercial video store. So, to this day, to me, any tape that I could rent as a kid at a well-lit mainstream video store isn't rare. You know, it's like, in my mind, I just... I can't wrap my head around the fact that some of those things were actually not that easy to see. Yeah, and that was that was actually it's funny. Last House on Dead Entry was another one that I had to get from Video Vault down in Alexandria. They uh, had and, it uncut. And I was gonna yeah. say it was it was one of the only places I'd known of that has had an uncut copy of that, uh, which I made art a uh, copy of using my like Go Video double deck like uh, VCR recording machine on like a high grade tape, and that tape was actually the one that was used to plug in the gore scene for the uh, barrel barrel DVD of uh, Last House on Dead End Street, which is really funny. Yeah, uh, for years, an inside joke between Bruce and I was me quoting him saying, I supplied the gore. But, uh, <laughs> but like, what was, like, um, yeah, I mean, I had a Venezuelan uncut version of that, but it slowed down. It's time right. expanded to fit the subtitles. But Bruce had a first-generation copy of a sun tape which was gold back a first generation dub of a sun tape of right. uncut last lesson dead <laughs> with the red um opening credit sequence too not just the blue screen with the white letters oh those were the days i still have that tape bruce you're um perfect, you're dub. perfect. i'm sure i do um so Go ahead. You're gonna you're gonna talk about the script a little bit, right? Yeah, so there's a, a couple things I do want to get into. Uh before we go on that though, weirdly, one of the trends that was going on at the time that for some reason the Italians didn't really latch on to was the whole slasher genre. And I could never quite figure out why they didn't do that. You had all these American movies full of teens. Um and I mean you get a handful here and there. You get, you get pieces, absurd. Yeah, absurd. pieces, absurd, uh stage fright, body uh, count. Body count. Um, I think they felt ripped off. I think they were like, they're ripping off us. Like, Giallo <laughs> was our thing. Slasher's like a light version of that, right? And like, but you, it is odd that they did that. There was not an explosion there. Yeah. Because um, those it, movies played there. It's not like, right. it's not like they didn't have fucking Jason in Italy. They did, you know? <laughs> and that that's one of the things that always kind of struck me different about it, watching an Italian movie over some of the uh, uh, American contemporaries was that. You know, the American movies were all full of, like, you know, kids, basically, you know, full of uh, teenagers or college kids or whatever. Whereas you watch these Italian movies and they're all full of adults. Uh, and it's really weird. And Burial Ground kind of even doubles down on the concept because the only kid in it is played by a fucking adult. No doubt. Um, the one thing I'm concerned about on this is, like, we, we talk about Nightmare Logic, right? And. Mm -hmm. Fulci and Dario get a pass on Nightmare Logic all the time. No one else does. They're like, it's stupid. It's dumb. <laughs> but when it's Fulci, who's my second favorite director of all time, and Argento is like my fourth, it's right. Nightmare Logic. Right. So it's is, so it's, is it's Burial Ground. It's atmospheric. Right. Yeah. And Burial yeah. Ground is also Nightmare Logic. It really I mean, is. And well, the and one there's... scene, the one scene that really, I, I, I just saw it, scene's been stuck in my head since I rewatched it, that is absolutely fucking horrifying and fumes right out of a nightmare is when they're sitting in the house and they just hear, boom, boom them hitting the, the walls with axes. That's mm -hmm. trying to get in. And you can't yeah, do nothing. It's great. Just it's sit great. there. It's terrifying. Right. Um, so I do want to go into uh, a bit about uh, the producer, uh, Gabriele Crisanti, um, before we, we, we talk about some of the movie proper. Um, so he was a Rome native, born in 1935. Uh, he studied production design, architecture and set design uh, and he got into the film business in the early 60s as a, a production designer and set designer um he claims he had uncredited work on uh, robert c Oddmax, the crimson pirate and joseph mankiewicz's big epic cleopatra um but he eventually moved on to producing his own movies in the late 60s um he also claims at that time that he was a founding member of an organization called the ATA, which was the he says it's the first international cinematographic cooperative. Uh, and he says he formed that with Orson Welles. Um, however, as far as the Internet goes, I can find no trace of this thing being an actual legit thing other than it's talk about Gabriele Crisanti. I can't find any trace of that with Orson Welles. But apparently, you know, it was some sort of distribution co-op uh, 
to help with international distribution. Um, so once the 60s rolled around into the 80s, he, he produced a little over two dozen titles. Uh, there were some Decamerotics and Spaghetti Westerns, um, but he really became known in the West mainly for his his horror films like this one. Um, there was the Mario Landy pair of Jalo in Venice and Patrick Lives Again. Um, he did Malabimba also with uh, Andrea Bianchi and Satan's Baby Doll with uh, Mario Bianchi. Um, and then in the end of the 80s, he actually directed a few Mondo films himself uh, and then eventually passed away in 2010. Um, but he does have a pretty interesting resume. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's enough to really catapult him into like the, the you know, household horror fan names. Um, but, you know, he, he did have a pretty sleazy run of movies there. Um, now, Andrea Bianchi uh, was the director of this film. Uh, he was born in 1925, and he apparently worked in the industry uncredited on a bunch of things through the 60s, although he did have a few production assistant or assistant director credits pop up uh, here and there. He didn't start directing proper until he was almost 50 uh, with Cry of a Prostitute, which is a really nasty uh, Plitziotesky with Henry Silva and Barbara Boucher. Uh, there's a real memorable scene where he kind of uh, basically rapes her while her face is stuck in like a hanging like pig carcass or something. It's a really crazy movie. Uh, there's a, a Code Red Blu-ray of it out. Uh, that's definitely worth a look. Um, he did a bunch of erotic comedies and dramas through the 70s. I have one called uh, My Father's Wife with Carol Baker. I actually have a Something Weird tape of that uh that seemed to have gotten pulled pretty quick uh but i still haven't watched that yet uh his big claim to fame uh, besides burial ground is probably the giallo uh, strip new for your killer uh with edwige Fenech and femi benussi uh femi benussi is probably one of my favorite italian like uh, uh actresses of that era i think she's great and should i to me she should be no just as known as like barbara boucher and uh, uh edwige Fenech and resolve the and all those girls but seems like not so much um, but Bianchi quickly got a reputation for making really sleazy films. Um, he had worked with uh, producer Crisanti on 1977's uh, Dear Sweet Niece, uh, and then he also did Malabimba with him in 1989 prior to this. Um, in the 80s, Bianchi moved on to hardcore porn doing almost two dozen titles, uh, including things like Tender But Hard and Hot Mouths. Um, but he occasionally did a few horror titles as well mixed in. Like he did that Angel of Death movie, uh, a.k.a. Commando Mengula, um, which for years people thought was a Jess Franco movie, uh, but it wasn't. Um, and he also did Maniac Killer with uh, Robert Ginty. Terrible um, film. Yeah, yeah, not great. <laughs> ne neither, neither of those are great, unfortunately. Um, and he passed away in 2013, um, which then brings us to the screenwriter, Mr. Piero Regnoli. Uh, he was born in 1921, so the dude was almost 60 when he wrote the script for Burial Ground, which kind of makes sense. Um, he started actually as a film critic for the Vatican City newspaper called the Roman Observer, um, and he was actually a member of the Venice Film uh, Venice International Film Festival jury uh, for about five or six years uh, throughout the 50s. Uh, and he moved on to screenwriting in the early 50s and wrote over 100 films spread across all genres. Uh, some of the bigger ones, uh, at least to horror fans. Uh, he did The Playgirls and the Vampires. Um, he did The Third Eye, which was the inspiration for D'Amato's uh, Bui Omega or Buried That's Alive. That's a great film. That's a great yeah, film. I really Franco liked Nero. it. Yes, really good. Uh, that that era restoration of that was really uh, jaw dropping. It was, it was nice to see that uh, you know number one English friendly and number two looking so good. Uh, he did Navajo Joe with Burt Reynolds. Um, he did Fulci's White Fang, uh, and then later he did uh, Demonia and Voices from Beyond. Um, he did Lindsay's Nightmare City that we talked about earlier, um, and he had previously written Bianchi's uh, Cry of a Prostitute and Malabimba. So he was, you know, they were very familiar with his work, and they had all kind of worked together uh, a bit. You know, so the whole kind of production team behind this uh, was a bit incestuous. You know, they were all, uh, which is appropriate, I guess. Um, I was so going to say incestuous. <laughs> yeah, if you've seen Malabimba or Burial Ground, you realize that uh, it's kind of how these things go. Isn't there a cry of a prostitute um, incest bit too? I don't know. I haven't seen it in a minute. I don't remember. I don't, I don't remember either. It's a good one though. Um, so talking about the script for Burial Ground or uh, uh, Le Nota del Terrori, uh, which is uh, uh, Nights of Terror, 
I don't know uh, if it's called Knights of Terror or what is it? Knights? Knights? <laughs> Nukes of Terror. <laughs> um, That's a German title. Right. Um, I thought the German title was Der Burial Ground. It probably is. It's, it's like D Der Rucker Der Zombies or something. Rucker Der Zombies. Yeah, something yeah. like that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I uh, my, my, my germ is a little rusty. I don't remember what that translates to. Um, but so it's a, it, like I said earlier, it's a very uh, meat and potato script. It has like no illusions of what it is. Um, it's basically just a world full of horny adults that go to a place and then are attacked by zombies. Uh, there's hardly any sort of character arcs unless you count the whole bit with Michael and his mom. Uh, there's like really not much in the way of story progression. It's like they just show up and then they run. You know, they try to stay away from these zombies. It's sort you're of a siege. Are you saying that? You so almost make that sound like a bad thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing at all. It's it's very much a siege scenario, which you know, kind of, I guess, harkens back a bit to you know the original zombie precursors of, of you know, Night of the Living Dead, uh, or you know, the the finale of Zombie uh, itself. Um, and the the it kind of the script is is very vague in what it is you know there's the bit the professor at the beginning where he's like i is i discovered the secret i'm the only one who knows and then proceeds to not tell anybody it's like yeah thanks like nobody knows uh like it, they, there's some vagaries about like etruscan magic um but there are kind of like weird supernatural elements thrown into the movie too like the exploding light bulbs and like energy pulses and stuff that like none of it's explained it's like like you were saying dave with it sort of being this nightmarish logic it's like things are just happening they're under assault and nobody knows what to do or how to stop it or anything well the idea of just no real plot of just constantly running and running and running and encountering the zombies is is every nightmare i've ever had in my life you're just right. running from something and you can't get away Mm -hmm. Well, you watch enough of these movies, and then you watch a movie that requires you to do the opposite, and instead of suspending logic, like, pay close attention, and, um, and you know, they're not gearing um, moments to Joe Slow in the back row, it can be quite jarring, because after the movie, the person you watched it with will be like, hey, what did that mean? And you're like, I was just watching it like I watched Burial Ground. I was just sitting back and... <laughs> yeah. Because sometimes you have to spend logic when watching a movie as opposed to other times you have to pay close attention to it. But yeah, if you um if you try to dissect any kind of um, logic in this film, you will be like, hmm, well that doesn't make a lot of sense. But um what does make sense is that Burial Ground is movie magic. But, it's um, a, a Etruscan movie magic. <laughs> I don't know why what do they, like <laughs> like am I out of am I off base agree or disagree with the following statement more so than most zombie movies the zombies in burial ground really look quite different from one another they like, do they, it's well, like that's they, not normal that's not how it's done normally it's really cool like there's a lot of different fucking weird zombies in this movie yeah so i i love the look of the zombies in this like they're they're really kind of nightmarish creatures it's almost like they're all kind of deformed and misshapen and they don't even necessarily have any regard for like real human anatomy they have like wonky oh. eyeballs and like there's the their ones with the teeth right their, together, their teeth yeah. are all crazy um and it kind of adds to you know what you're saying dave like these this movie's sort of like a nightmare like nothing in it is quite right including the look of these these ghouls that are coming after them uh and that you know they're they're just dripping with worms and maggots, and they're like completely rotten in their their little uh, 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 garb, uh, you know. And you know I think it was Chaz Ballin who, who described them as highly motivated as well. Um, so you have them using tools, they're scaling walls, uh, you know they're they're you know they they build a goddamn battering ram. Like, it's ridiculous, like, the lengths they go to just, uh, oh. uh, you know, to they're coming to get you no matter what. Uh, and it's it's relentless. Uh, and it's, it's you know, really nihilistic. Um, and, yeah, I think it's great. There is a throwaway line in Dawn of the Dead that's, like, uh, uh, says, like, oh, there are reports some of these creatures are using tools. But I do not believe in any way, shape, or form that had any sort of influence on this movie whatsoever. Pure uh, motorized instinct. Yep. <laughs> right. <laughs> they are described by one of the characters in this movie as moving slow. We like to think of Italian zombies as fast 
American zombies is slow, but these are slow zombies. And one of the characters is like, well, let's let them in the house. They're slow. <laughs> like, let Again, them in. nightmare logic. You're like, no, Come right. in. But the reason I think the zombies look the way they do is I think that they're going more for the zombie look from zombie. Yes. The graves. But they're also going for like an EC comic style. Mm -hmm. And if you notice, they're all in robes. And I bet that goes back to the, the magic kind of element, which these things might have been part of a sec because later they run into the monks, and they might be some like the Knights Templar. And yep. I think this is taken from Tombs of the Blind Dead, too, more so Could than be. a lot of other zombie films. So I think it's like a mixture, and it's just all these little influences and just the kind mm -hmm. of dealing and the special effects artists kind of making their own thing. And it became a really unique look for them. Yeah, it's, it's funny. You know, I do definitely think that, you know, this movie is less romero exploitation and more fulci exploitation oh, yeah. like it really feels like its direct influences were all european you know it, it really doesn't feel like it's trying to be any sort of american movie at all god i love night of the living dead but i would watch burial ground over night of the living dead any fucking day of the week. <laughs> and um you know i i i love martin but man like i love to um i love to talk shit sometimes on Romero fans just because it's locally like it's like a local sports team or something people are just like religious about it here but um god burial ground like that'd, that that'd this be, is the quintessential zombie movie <laughs> that would it be is. like me talking shit about Don Dolor like no Romero is a, a god <laughs> Romero, I, I Romero like every man woman and child in Pittsburgh has seen no let me dead it's like our like miracle on 34th street like it's like <laughs> it's like has everybody the one seen play, Alien Factor? I, I hope. Yeah. I hope. <laughs> I mean, Don Dohler is fucking awesome. I love um, his movies, but yeah. they're not Romero movies. Or the, popu <laughs> the popularity of Romero. I'd say John Waters is more your Romero. Right, or, or Barry Levinson or something. Like it's This is not an obscure movie. Like This is some movie that really got out there both theatrically and then on home video well, it was theatrical like, it was vhs it was multiple DVD, dvds multiple Blu -rays, blu-rays 4k now 4k yeah i mean i mean yeah, and, it's, and, it's, and not, it's had like theatrical revivals like yeah like um it's not first tier mm -hmm. but maybe second tier as far as that goes like yeah i've, I've really seen kind it, of a lot. i've seen yeah. it on 35 millimeter thanks to exhume films probably three or four times now yeah. in my life uh and it never gets old uh, it's always fun to see How does the 16mm look blown up? Is it extra grainy? Uh, the, like, the, it has to look different than it does uh, on video. I mean, the prints were really cheap. They look like shit. They were dark. Uh, I mean, the, we'll get into the company a little bit later, but yeah, it's just... It they, should be I, grainy, though. Like, when you blow, there's that cool look that it's 16 not, it's not, I don't. I don't remember it being super grainy. Interestingly, okay. the first... I think it's the first 88 films Blu-ray of it. Actually, as an extra, has a, print. Yep. Has a scan of a 35 print on there. Uh, I wouldn't watch it like that. I mean, I've seen it like that, so I don't care. Um, but that no, is on there. No, it's cool to look at, not to watch all the right. way through, but yeah. to like exactly. Yeah, yeah um, the movie so was always infamously kind of a dark-looking movie. Right. In VHS, like the part where they pull the maid down, well, I'm like, what? The no, movie? but like, then they they overcompensated, and the original Media Blasters release is too bright, and like. Yeah. Um, my first player was an Apex. Remember the multi I do. Yeah, Apex? I had it too. And, um, yeah. It was like, so we all it was like this big. Yeah, it was huge. It was bigger than a VCR. And then Five what? Um, certain movies would sort of flicker a little bit. This was right. one of those. Like it was. Um, it was. Uh, yeah, how far we've come with this movie. I just got in the Severin Blu-ray. Yeah, literally, oh, literally two days before recording this, and I popped that in, and I was just like, or not the Severin Blu-ray, but the Severin 4K yeah. UHD. Uh, and I was just like, dear God, like how far we've come. Like, it's insane to think that, you know. Well, and there's a pillowcase. Like, um, I mean, like, what do a tie-in. I item. was going to say, do you have it in hand's range? Yeah, I know, you, right I know you bought it. It's right here. <laughs> so while, you, while, while you're finding it, I, uh, since we were talking about the, uh, uh, the effects a bit, uh, I did want to talk about the effects guys. Because there is a lot of confusion over who did the effects for this movie. Um, now, there's multiple credits in you know during the end credits um that have listings um so there's hold on uh, let's let's see if you can do this without it getting blurred out we'll make it work there, there we, we go. go it just Beauty. has his face it's so fucking funny it's so funny that scene right. is funny in the actual movie it's <laughs> God, like, God. It's like flowery like <laughs> and like that's where like they knew it was funny right like there's there's things right. in the movie that like 
had to be known to be funny to the. You don't movie. hire that guy and not be on, in on the joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, so for the special effects, you know, like I said, there, there's been a lot of confusion over who actually did the effects. Um, so there's multiple names in the credits. Uh, so Gino De Rossi is listed as special effects in the credits, uh, which right there, that's going to throw a lot of people. Uh, then you have Rosario Prestopino listed as masks and special makeup effects. And then you have uh, Mauro Gavazzi listed as chief makeup. So Mauro Gavazzi is... He basically did the the standard makeup, you know, not the special effects makeup or anything like that. Uh, Rosario makeup on the actress's luscious lips, exactly. Uh, Rosario Prestopino, uh, you know, as credited, did the masks and the special makeup effects. The confusion comes in with Gino De Rossi listed as special effects. Uh, for years, especially you know before the pre-internet, uh, the fact that Gino De Rossi was not the same person as Gianetto De Rossi uh, was something that people just didn't know. Everybody assumed that they were one and the same because here's this guy named Gino De Rossi being listed as special effects when Gianetto De Rossi did special, you know, all the gore effects for all these other movies. Uh, so even like back in those original Deep Red reviews and stuff, uh, you know, a lot of these fanzine era things, they listed Gianetto De Rossi doing the, the doing the gore for this movie, right. uh, not not realizing that. You know, Gino De Rossi was not a shortening of Gianetto De Rossi. The fact that they were two different, completely unrelated people. So a lot of people seem to think because it says special effects that Gino De Rossi had stuff to do with the makeup. Um, but it's not that simple. Uh, it's essentially it's it's just sort of like a translation boogaboo with the actual credits. So when they say special effects, they don't mean fx the way that we do you know in america uh essentially he was a man that was mostly known for like pyrotechnics and squib work and rigging things and like mechanical effects so for this movie he was probably responsible for when they're shooting the zombies and when the zombie heads are exploding um it was to the point where he was actually nicknamed uh bombardoni uh which means the bomber in italy for his explosions, he was known to kind of like pack things up more than he should uh, for his actual pyrotechnics. Um, and he had worked on movies like, uh, you know, the Polizio Tesco, uh, Weapons of Death, which I really like, uh, The Chosen, uh, the original Glorious Bastards. He was on uh, The Gates of Hell and Make Them Die Slowly. I think he had something to do with like rigging up the harnesses for uh, Zora Karova hanging from her boobs. Um, but he also worked on, on some big budget stuff too like Bertolucci's The Last Emperor he worked on Hudson Hawk uh, Casino Royale the more recent James Bond movie uh, and that weird like Russian remake of Ben-Hur that came out like a few years back that Bob Morowski actually worked on editing uh, weirdly enough um, so yeah Gino De Rossi you know you might see him credited as doing the makeup for this but really it was Rosario Prestopino uh, now Rosario Prestopino was he was born in 1950 um, he worked from the mid 70s into the 2000s uh, so he had a pretty good run and he really worked for all the major directors uh, you know Ruggiero Diodato Lucio Fulci Dario Argento um, he assisted on some stuff like Caligula and Zombie uh, and he worked on Dr. Butcher MD The Gates of Hell New York Ripper Demons Opera um, but to me he was always overshadowed by the fact that people like Gianetto De Rossi or Sergio Stivaletti were doing the effects for those movies. Uh, so you, you don't really hear the name Rosario Prestopino in the same breath as those guys, uh, but as far as I'm concerned, you should, because he's he was right there in the thick of it during the whole run of like late 70s uh, and all of 80s uh, Italian horror movies. Um, so you want to talk a bit about the dubbing to this movie, Art? Uh, I know you had mentioned earlier you couldn't imagine ever watching it uh, in Italian. Uh, do you think that the dubbing kind of uh, lends credence to some people saying it's so bad it's good? Or No, do you think... no, no, no. So, to me, um, and I talked about this on another episode, there's this huge support and adoration of the new Godzilla movie, Godzilla Minus One. Right. And people are just like, oh, wow, what a wonderful movie. To me, when I fell in love with Godzilla as a kid, it was the late tier, like Godzilla versus the Smog Monster, ridiculous movies with the like Save the Earth theme song, the bright green Godzilla, exactly. and the like dubbing. 
and like the dubbing became part of the aesthetic like mm -hmm. what i like about godzilla what i like about um you know a big piece of it was that weird aesthetic you get from the dubbing and these italian movies like the dubbing yes it's absurd yes it's silly yes we laugh but it becomes a part of the aesthetic like right. because these movies weren't shot with sync sound they're also weird in Italian, I'm sure. Now, maybe not to the same extent. But, like, the weirdo, goofy dubbing is funny. But when you also have the extreme gore, like the like the woman hanging with her hands, like, nailed into the into the windowsill, like, that's a that's a pretty mean sequence, you know? Right, they, they chop and her so, head off with the scythe and, and stuff. And it's so great. it almost becomes sicker, sort of like some of the other confrontational movies we've talked about like the untold story or last house on the left they almost become sicker because they have this like puerile like vibe to it on the side but like you know of course we're gonna get to the peter bart character and the famous scene near the end but like um the i, I watched that in italian just to <laughs> see the other day and like it's it's still funny, but the dubbing just makes what's already a completely over the top absurdist thing just like all the weirder. And it's a tone that you really can't recapture. It's like really like a singular a singular thing that you get from the um, the the dubbing. Even now that it's not really dubbing dubbing like. Ruggiero Deodato's most recent movie. I love the sync sound. The, like, not sync sound. I'm sorry. The, like, bad ADR and, like, the <laughs> goofy. It's in English. The lips are basically in sync. But the people are still saying ridiculous shit. Right. And it's, like, still, like, ADR a lot of it. Um, it has to be, you know? Without knowing, I know, you know? Um, and, yeah, like, the voices of the people in Burial Ground are known. A lot of them are known people who we've... Um, heard their voices in many other movies and so you know that's always cool when you become a big enough nerd that you're like oh that's so and so from Suspiria or you know like unlike some movies it is known who dubbed who in Burial Ground I don't have that in front of me but um I know that um one of the female voices is um is one of the leads in Suspiria for example but um no I think the absurdist dubbing is inseparable from the aesthetic it's I like agree. a big piece of what i love about burial ground right and um yeah i'm the same way with you know, you know I, I all the politiotesky movies all the jolly and everything any chance i get i'm going to watch the english dub <laughs> oh, kung, fu, yeah, like, kung fu movies from the 70s uh, you know, like you said kaiju movies you know all that stuff there's a great um there's a great blu-ray of last house on the beach from austria and it's missing an english language track and even though that movie's in italian and it has the italian track and i can watch it in sync sound it's such a different experience i want to hear the guy say i don't like nuns priests neither i want to hear the goofy <laughs> like the right. goofy lines i want to hear that that's how i know these movies i know it's not that i'm scared of subtitles or some like duh. i love subtitles you know right. you show me like i'm not gonna watch like a new art house movie dubbed when i can exactly. watch it i'm not an idiot but the these movies people who want to watch cannibal holocaust in italian why like it's right. not in italian you know um i don't know can so, you imagine losing this will keep you high and dry, Professor? Like that's one of the, <laughs> my favorite underlined, under underrated line in that movie. But so, I, so I want to say something real quick about the dubbing too. Okay. For Art. Art says, and I agree with him here. The dubbing does add an unintentional layer of comedy at times. Mm -hmm. But if you watch Strip Nude for Your Killer, if people are saying that Burial Ground is completely unintentional in its humor. You take Burial uh, Strip Nude for Your Killer, which has intentional humor. The overweight right. guy having sex with the the blow up doll. You tell me that was not that's that's pure humor right. funny or not it's a ten, attempt at humor so if you take that kind of aspect in the filmmaking you would say that the, and andrea bianchi is trying to make humor in burial ground so you have intentional absurdist comedy mixed with unintentional dubbing comedy which makes for such a bizarre mixture of of humor that you're just like i don't even know where i am at right now that's why right, i think right. some of the appeal is of the movie yeah, i never thought of that until yeah, just so now yeah, some of the lines, it's funny because it's like they're, it, the lines are in English, 
but you can just tell that they're not by people who normally speak English. You know, something just feels off about it, which kind of adds to the whole off-kilter feel of the entire movie. Uh, but some of the lines, to me, are just absolutely priceless. Well, I, like like I, the, I, guy, the guy, uh, you know, where, where he's taking pictures of the girl, and she's like, oh, you know, do I get a raise as a model? And he's like, well, you're getting a raise out of me, but we're not talking about money. Um, or, or the scene where the girl just walks into the room with lingerie that she found in an old chest in the other room, and he's like, "Oh, you look just like a little whore." But I like that in a girl, and just I mean, it's, it's like it's really funny. Like but you ask yourself, why did the dubbers say these lines? Like, why didn't they step in and say, "Hey, that's a little bit goofy"? But having known some people who've done dubbing, like um, Jaretta Jaretta, I'm like, yeah. why did you not like try to fix that? And she's like. The way she talks in reality is kind of like one of these people. Like she sort of <laughs> speaks in like dub speak. It's fascinating. Like she wouldn't say like, "Do you want to go to dinner?" She'd be like, "What time shall we go eat?" You know, or some like just some weird like syntax that's not the one you would use. Right, like, doesn't sound quite natural. Right. right. And I'm, I asked David Hess. I'm like, "Fucking pizza eater? Like, why did you call Franco Nero a fucking pizza eater?" You know. And like he's like, well, it was funny, like you know, like, <laughs> like he's like, I, I, I do resist that line, but it's like, I mean, I don't know, it's it's, it's one of the things that makes burial ground burial ground is this just absurd dubbing, and I don't laugh at it, like I, I really, I don't think burial ground is trash, and I mean the makeup's too cool, and like the like sets too cool, it's not like, like it's a lavish movie, it's not like some shot on video garbage it's like um you know like just too well put together to dismiss in that way but yeah it's fucking funny i mean the dubbing's hilarious and that's part of what we like um it's it's the aesthetic and it's not for everyone not everyone can you know not laugh at it but um we're laughing with it more than we're laughing at it exactly um, the gore too know. The special effects, oh, some some of them are a little wonky, but some of them are fucking excellent. Yeah, and, yeah. and the kills, the kills are brutal. Well, they're varied brutal. and the right, they're super violent. Uh, and like I said, you know, you just have these relentless Whoa. zombies the coming after work, you. Stunt work, like setting people on fire, is right. not like something you can do just willy nilly. Like like they they took some risks and they mm -hmm. had some real talent in some of those departments. Like that's real stunt work. That's not right. kids fucking around, you know. Um, so I do want to talk about some of the cast a bit. Now, uh, the producer, uh, Frisanti, basically said the movie was too low budget to really bring in much in the way of cast members. Uh, so there really wasn't anybody too well known. Uh, like Corrine Well, who plays the blonde, um, you know, she was in, you know, a handful of, you know, erotic comedies and, you know, some sort of erotic dramas and stuff. You know, she had about maybe like 15 roles or something. Uh, and Jean-Luigi Crisizi. Uh, he was the guy with the, the photographer. Um, same with him. You know, he was in, you know, dozen, 15 movies or so. Terror but Express not... is his big one that I remember mm -hmm. from, Terror Express. Um, but yeah, I mean, for the most part, most of their credits is just stuff we, you know, we chances are we'll never see because it's just not really in our field of interest for the most part. Uh, now, Mary Angela Giordano, um, obviously she was kind of a... Uh, 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 a familiar face in this um it's funny because you know when i first saw this movie you know as a as a early teenager like i said earlier it was, it was so weird to me that like everybody in this was like so old looking and like there were all these like grown-ups everybody's old like there's the one guy that looks like eric idol uh and yeah like to me mary angela uh mary angela giordano was always like an old lady but now like I still think that, but she's actually like at this point, she's younger than me in art by like a lot. She was like 43 when she made this movie. Uh, and it, yeah, it's just, it, it's so funny to me. Um, but she was born in 1937. Uh, and you know, pretty girl, uh, ended up, you know, being a beauty pageant girl. Uh, she won Miss Lejuria in 1954 at age 17. And from there, pretty much just jumped into acting. Uh, and she did a bunch of movies, you know, Peplum, Spaghetti Westerns, you know, all through the 60s. Um, but she's mostly known for her 70s and 80s horror movies, you know, even though she has over 70 credits to her name. Interestingly enough, I was going through one of those 
uh, Spaghetti Westerns that was in uh, one of those recent Arrow sets called El Poro. Uh, and she's in that as like a bar wench. And like, I didn't even recognize her because she was so young looking at the time. Uh, and it wasn't until I was listening to the commentary, they pointed her out. And I'm just like, holy shit, that is her. Um, but yeah, later, you know, in the she later popped up in uh Michele Suave's The Sect. She's in Just Franco's Killer Barbies, where she still did a nude scene at like age 60. Um, but yeah, at the time she was uh involved romantically with uh Gabriele Crisanti, the producer, um, which is why he you know probably put her in you know pretty much all the all these horror movies that she was uh that he was producing. Uh, and I mean, she has a you know, the hell you are over there. So she has a uh, <laughs> she has a pretty memorable death scene in this, um, which you know, getting your boob bit off uh, would would you know kind of be a highlight in most people's careers. Uh, but she even gets it worse in the two Mario Landy movies she did. You know, in Gore and Venice, you know, she's tied to a table naked and gets her legs sawed off. And then in Patrick Still Lives, you know, there's that whole scene with a floating fireplace poker uh, that goes straight into her vagina. Um, so yeah, she really had quite a a, a crazy career. That there scene for, is, is under seen. That's a that's a um, one of the most vile scenes in film history. Right? Yeah, they're it's they're crazy. So both, graphic. Both those movies are so ridiculous, and it, it's just it's so funny that you know basically you had this old man producer putting his you know uh, middle aged girlfriend in these these crazy horror movies, and then just has her die horrifically. You know, she's like up there with like Daniela Doria with Fulci movies, you know? Or Zora Karova. Yeah. Right, right. Well, I mean, Stuart Gordon always put his wife in there to kill her off, too. So, I mean, it's just like, maybe subconsciously be like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what it is. Or maybe you just don't, not as embarrassed asking him to do something completely fucking awful. That's a right. stranger. Mm-hmm. Um, so, the, the other actor of note, I guess, is uh, Pietro Barzocchini. Uh, better known to most people Peter. for for decades as Peter Bark. Um, I don't know if you guys want to talk about him. Well, he, for a bit. he wasn't he wasn't in that many movies. He um, he was only in like four or five, I think. And he was like cast in like the manner that you just like hear stories about. Like he was, I think he, if I'm not mistaken, and no, Ettinger's gonna get it wrong, but wasn't <laughs> he just like spotted on the street with his parents somewhere? Yeah, that's that's my understanding. Like, yeah, someone like, was like, yeah, you're cool again. You're weird looking. And different and like that like the casting of him in this movie is where you have to give the filmmakers like some props like it's not as simple as they would needed someone young looking who was above age because of the tip biting scene like they knew that they were casting a fucking freak in this world <laughs> they knew that he was funny looking like they knew that it was gonna be funny and um, wild and and all the rest and something that would make the movie stand out and like as soon as you see him in this movie you're like what is this man child doing right <laughs> why is he here and like yeah the tip writing scene comes later but there's you know him walking in on them him like kind of lusting after his mom and that's it's like, the thing it's like he's he's like italian cinema's greatest cock blocker it's like yeah. the whole fucking time like that dude just wants to get laid and every time he turns around uh, Peter Barks there, uh, just getting in the way, just screwing I, things up for him. I don't think anybody deserved to get laid in this movie because all the guys were just wearing <laughs> fucking turtlenecks. Right. Stop with the damn turtlenecks already. <laughs> I mean, they are gross dudes who think the most of themselves. The um, the women are like ten out of ten. Great. Yeah, right. They look. They look great. And um, they, I like what they have to wear. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> but like, what? Like, I remember the way certain scenes in movies made me feel the first time I saw them. And I'm pretty young to, you know, be watching Burial Ground by most people's moral codes or whatever, but like, you know, I like I thought that Peter Bark like being like consoled by his mother when he's all dead at the end and then he just like fucking goes for the tit after that <laughs> weird dialogue. I my mind was just like I was I could not stop laughing. I like had to pause the movie. Like you know, that's the thing. Like about watching something at home. Like you know, man. Like I rewound that scene immediately and watched it again. And I was just like, this is so funny. This right. is like like one of the craziest things I've seen at that point. And just like, what a hilarious moment in film history. And that voice, mommy, mommy. Like oh my god. <laughs> 
you know, I just Well and then uh, you had that weird scene earlier too. Yeah. Where he's like he's he's trying to Remember put his hand over his skirt yeah. and stuff, right? Yeah, he's sliding his hand up her right. leg and you're like I mean You're like that's why really, like why is this troll trying to finger bang his mom? Yeah, like, it's, and it's I mean, so like, bizarre. God and mom like mom doesn't seem too against it. Like she <laughs> reprimands him, but like you know, she kind of is like, well, you know, kids are gonna be kids, and then, um, yeah, what a, what a weird element to the movie, and yeah. it just ma it makes the movie really does. Yeah, I don't think and we realized go how good we had it. You know what I mean? Like watching right. all these crazy ass movies, and now if something like that happened in a modern movie, I'd be like, and it was played like fairly straight, I'd be like, because <laughs> I'd be just so like the sadness. I keep bringing it up because the sadness is the only one. That seems like it played that shit straight and did fucked up shit, and it was just fun. Uh, I really like the sadness. Like um, that movie, I fell for Hink Hook, Line, and Sinker. Me too. Me and too. what I really like about the sadness is more than other gory movies in recent years. It's a gore movie first and foremost. Like, right. and we don't really do that anymore. You know, like the '80s had the great gore <laughs> comedies of Reanimator, Toxic Avenger, Psychos in Love, Street Trash. Um, a few others that I'm forgetting, but there's like only like a handful of like must see '80s gore comedies. But the ones that there are are so good, right? Like, and um, the sadness really is just a gore movie, so over the top, and just like it really that's its focus, but it does it so well, right? And uh, yeah, really a fun movie, and I, I wish more people would see it. That's a modern classic there. Um, there's other good modern horror movies. I like, you know, I just saw a movie this weekend, Stop Motion, that I thought was excellent. Like, not good, excellent. Like, a, a highly recommended new British horror movie that IFC got into theaters. And people aren't really talking about it, you know? People I haven't heard be, about it. No, it's great. Go check it out. IFC put it up. Stop Motion, one word. Cool movie. Weird movie. Twisted little movie. Hmm. Um... But, do we want um, to talk? Do we want to talk about the music a bit? Yeah, sure. All right, have at it. <laughs> I mean, it's generally creepy. It, it it's like very loud, and I don't know. I'm not too good technically with music. I just know that the score again comes right from that nightmare logic. Right. It, it just is a creepy kind of all over the place. You know what I mean? Almost yeah. gothic kind of style thing, but it fits with the movie again. Like I said, Crip Zombies. I feel like the score is just should be called Crip Zombies. <laughs> So there, there's two composers listed. There's a uh, uh, Elcio Mancuso and Bert Rexon, which is actually a uh, uh, anglization of Berto Pisano, um, who you know he had worked with Crisanti before. Uh, the music in this movie is interesting. Uh, so it kind of you know there there's that jazzy main theme as they're driving. That's a, sort of like a riff on like Dave Brubeck's Take Five. Um, then there's a couple other jazzy bits. There's, uh, you know, the, 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 during the attack scenes, there's like those things with like the strings and stuff. And then there's a lot of like electronic music and I'm not so, sure, I'm not sure which of these guys did what, uh, and I don't necessarily know if any of this stuff was composed specifically for this movie. Um, some of it's it, in another movie. Yeah. Some of yeah, it's in another it, film. It, it feels all over the place. Um, which kind of just helps add to the off-kilter feel of the whole movie. The fact that sometimes the music doesn't quite seem like it's fitting or it's just coming in out of nowhere, and then there's the, all that droning electronic stuff, like as they're in the house, you know, walking around by candlelight and stuff. It really kind of, like, creates this atmosphere. Uh, potentially accidentally, but I, I really do think that the, well, the, the off-kilter score really adds to the film. Italian horror of that period is known for its electronic and its um, and prog and that style of soundtrack but most of the movies even that are heavy in those styles also have at least an element of a more classical style score right. and this movie definitely blends those two two styles together so and i think that that creates sort of um what in music is called counterpoint like you have two pretty um pretty distinct styles sort of competing with each other um but it's de it definitely the electronic soundtrack and like with like the prog infusion that makes it that like modernizes it, you know, right, right, um, and puts it squarely into the 
late 70s, early 80s. Um, so, no, it's a cool soundtrack. And um, I believe that, I can't recall what movie, but I believe that some of it appears in another film. Um, Which would make sense. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. I mean, there, there was a while where I was actually just convinced that these were just library tracks uh, that were just kind of pulled and dropped into the movie. Um, but, you know, the fact that Crisanti had worked with them previously makes me wonder how, what exactly the relationship was. Or if maybe all that stuff was, uh, you know, maybe it's like Harry Manfredini, where he just composed a whole bunch of music and just licensed it out for whatever. Yeah. Um, so who knows? Um, I do want to talk a bit about the locations in the movie. Um, so the main house uh, is is the Villa Parisi. Um, it's located about 13 miles outside of Rome. Uh, it was built in 1603. Uh, it's one of the 12 villas that was built in the area by the affluent. Um, and this one was for the then governor of Rome, uh, who was later appointed a cardinal by the Pope. Uh, he sold it, uh, and it was redesigned about a decade later, uh, and that's when there was an addition put on. Those fountains that we see in the movie were put in. Um, later, uh, it was lived in by a prince. Napoleon's sister lived there for a little while. Um, and, of course, everybody kind of did their own additions to it. Um, there's been over 130 movies filmed there. Um, obviously, some big ones like Blood for Dracula, but then there's like small scenes in like Strange Rice of Mrs. Ward, Death Smiles of a Murderer. Um, Mondo Macabre put out a Blu-ray of this movie called The Slave a while back, um, and that one has like parties in the courtyard there and stuff. That one was really noticeable to me. Um, Desert of the Tartars, uh, Kinski's, uh, Klaus Kinski's Paganini biopic, um, even some bigger stuff like Hudson Hawk and uh, Abel Ferrer's Pasolini uh, had stuff filmed there. Um, it was obviously a, a spot that Crisanti liked. Um, I first remember vividly watching uh patrick lives again or patrick still lives whatever you want to call it um and like in the bootleg days and recognizing the house like not even realizing they're from the same producer um i obviously uh recognize miss giordano in it um but yeah just i you know i, I remember feeling a sense of pride being like holy shit this is the burial ground house um and they use it again a bit in uh Jalo in venice um but I, th I think it's a great location especially for uh this sort of movie is, you know, the windows themselves are like kind of already fortified with like those metal bars and stuff. Um, it has those great, uh, 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 the fountains and the gardens and just, it has like a really good look to it. There's um, a sound stage that appears in it also that appears in, I think Inferno, right? Yeah. So, uh, so, so th during the, during the climax of the movie, uh, in when they're in the workshop, um, where, you know, the, the tit biting happens and then the final climax uh, freeze frame. Um, so that was actually a set at DePaula Studios. Uh, and I think it's the only set of the movie. Uh, possibly some of those underground uh, art areas, like where the, Mama, this cloth smells of death. That may have been a set too. Um, but definitely this workshop was a set. Um, I first recognized it as being part of the climax of Inferno. Um so it's really kind of funny once you look at that architecture like those the sort of like stone brickwork and mm -hmm. there's the uh staircase on like the left hand side um it's like barely redressed from what it looked like in inferno um so those two like came to you know came to me naturally i had later saw that it was also used in contamination luigi colsi's contamination um and there is like as soon as I, I I thought about it, that because contamination is another movie I practically have memorized. I was like immediately I'm like it has to be the scene when they are in the coffee building, you know, when they're in the coffee headquarters. They're down in the basement. It has to be where those uh where they have all the eggs in the incubators in like the room outside of the alien cyclops. And sure enough, I went back to that movie and I looked, and while it doesn't show the balcony. It does have that staircase to the left that they come down into, like right as they get into the gunfight, like Ian McCulloch gets in that gunfight uh, where they have all the eggs in the incubators and he's like shooting them and they're blasting them and people are getting shit splashed on them and blowing up. Yeah. Um, so I also saw a note on IMDb that lists that the same set was also used for Cannibal Apocalypse. However, I went back and I fast forwarded through Cannibal Apocalypse twice. You and I, find I, I can't for the life of me figure out where that is. It's so distinct looking, that brickwork and that staircase. Uh, I wonder if it's in the shop when they cut the guy up and you can't really tell because all that stuff. Yeah, is that I don't know. Right. Like where they're doing the bone saw through his leg. Yeah, might yeah be maybe. Um, or when they kill the guy, they bite his tongue out. 
when she's in the hospital. Who yeah, knows? I, it's got to right. be something where it's not shown very well. Right. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's it's noticeable in at least Inferno and uh, Contamination. Like I, I didn't notice it in Contamination until I was looking for it in Contamination. Uh, but Inferno, I spotted it pretty easily. Uh, so before we get out of the movie, I do want to talk about the prophecy of the black spider, <laughs> uh, which is <laughs> I, 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 it just gets me every time. <laughs> Not because which, it's misspelled, just because I'm like, what the fuck is the prophecy of the black spider? So it's a good question for for years. Everybody has just been like saying it's just a bunch of nonsense that they threw in. Uh, but I did a little bit of digging. Um, so obviously the prophecy is a bunch of bunk. However. There was a black oh, as opposed to all those prophecies in history <laughs> that are no, you mean the right. fact that it even was a thing, I mean. right? Right. Um, however, there was a prophet known as the Black Spider, Ragno Nero. Um, it was suspected to be a Franciscan monk named Federico Martelli, uh, who lived in 14th century Florence. Um, so before this movie came out in 1981, in Italy there was a book published of his prophecies from a, dis a manuscript that was discovered in the seventies. So the book is full of like all sorts of like weird religious and, you know, war predictions, you know, talking about like mushroom clouds and AIDS and war in the middle East. But like most predictions, it depends what you read into it. You know, everybody's, you know, it's all these vagaries that people are trying to latch shit onto later, just like Nostradamus, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, but, you know, it is funny to me that in Italy, there was a book published of the prophecies of the black spider. And this movie ends with a prophecy of the black spider. You know, everybody thought it was just some made up nonsense, whereas it does at least have some sort of relevance in Italy to something current that was happening when this movie was in production. So it's not made up nonsense. It's just nonsense. Right. It's still okay. made up. It's still made up nonsense. But, but just before the, this movie. But, right. But not the kind of made up nonsense. <laughs> not the kind of made up nonsense we thought it was. Uh, so I do want to. I guess we should get into the distribution history of this movie, at least in the United States. Um, so for theatrical, it was uh, distributed by FCG, which was uh, the film concept group. Um, and they only released a few other titles, like Paul Nash's The Craving was a big one, uh, Guardian of Hell, which is a retitling of Bruno Mattei's The Other Hell, uh, which is a solid little movie. Um, IMDb lists uh, Grismer's Blood Rage as one of their titles. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, it is, there... because it was it was that later acronym, though. What did they, they call af What were they called no. after that? Or is Lightning? this the second one? This is, this is the no. second one, FCG. Oh, yeah, it was, yeah. It was released. Uh, and I saw Nightmare at Shadow Woods at um a theater in my hometown where burial ground also played uh, they did release it that's true that's um, turned into lightning too or they owned it didn't they i can't remember lightning is a subsidiary of Astron. yeah that's yeah. what i thought um and they also imdb also lists bruno Mate's rats as one of their distributed to, titles not to not to jump around but yeah vestron released it on video they had nothing to do with the theatrical right. they had just they got into theatrical later and we'll get to that in a moment um so the men behind fcg where uh, the main guy was John Chambliss, uh, and he was originally uh, with MPM, Motion Picture Marketing, um, and they were the ones that released like Mausoleum and Gates of Hell and stuff like that. Um, he was kind of known as a crook uh, when Chris Pajali uh, interviewed Lon Kerr, who was another guy from MPM for Deep Red Magazine. He said he told me that uh, basically Lon Kerr wouldn't even talk about John Chambliss. Um, so John Chambliss was actually one of the guys that produced Final Exam and Savage Streets. Uh, so he had money in both of those. Uh, and it's funny, if you look on the poster of Burial Ground and even the Vestron video box, it has two names on the front cover uh, that like list them as like presenting Burial Ground. Yeah. And, you're, and you're like, who the fuck are these guys? I never even thought about it till we yeah, started we looked, doing this. Yeah. Uh, so one of the guys was John Chambliss. Uh, who, again, was reported to be a major crook. The second guy on there was Michael Franzese. Um, and he was a guy, he had money also in Mausoleum and Savage Streets, and he produced Knights of the City, uh, which I think I watched on your Plex, Dave, uh, which is the one about the inner city gang that wants to land a record deal. I, uh, I know the cover art, and I, I don't know if I've ever watched the movie. I don't think I have, but I know yeah, the movie. Yeah, it was actually pretty fun. 
Uh, but Michael Franzese was actually a major crime boss. So when it's rumored that these companies had mafia ties, this one 100% had mafia ties. Uh, he was a capo for the Colombo Crime Syndicate. Uh, he was born the son of an underboss, uh, and he jumped into the family business after, his, you know, at age 20, his dad was sentenced to 50 years uh, in jail. Um, at the time that he was involved in this movie, um, which it's debatable how much involvement he actually had in this uh but he was re reportedly quoted as saying that he was pulling in uh, $8 million a week. Uh, so I'm sure this company was some sort of a mob front. Uh, in 1985, he was part of this huge gasoline bootleg operation. Uh, basically, they were pulling in tax-free gas from Panama and then selling it to people up here. They were writing it off on like these third-party companies. And then when the government would try to come after these third-party companies, they would then bankrupt those companies so they wouldn't have to pay anything uh, and there's this whole big scam he, he got stinged for it uh or stung uh later that year now he was sentenced to jail i think in 1986 uh but yeah nowadays he's like a motivational speaker a book writer uh he has a youtube channel where he's talking about all this stuff but yeah the, the idea that you know the release of burial ground was some sort of weird underhand mob money laundering thing is really funny to me um the other thing about that is, uh, so Burial Ground, the title Burial Ground, is a completely American title. Uh, it was made up specifically for their ad campaign. Um, and since then, unlike a lot of these Americanizations, uh, this one's kind of gone on to be the de facto title for this release, uh, for this movie, at least as far as fandom's concerned, uh, to the point where even like the recent UK releases were called Burial Ground instead of just the Knights of Terror. Um, so I always thought that was kind of fun as compared to things like Gates of Hell. I, I know Art and I are on the same page with this, that you know a lot of these early US VHS titles, that's how we knew them. So to me, that movie will never be anything but Gates of Hell or Night of the Zombies or Make Them Die Slowly, uh, stuff like that. Uh, but this one, Barrier Ground, actually seemed to kind of catch on and stick with the rest of the world. I think it's a much better title than uh, uh, Knights of Terror, honestly. Sure. Yeah, all, all those titles are actually better. Right. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, make them die slowly. I mean, how can you Way better. with that? That's a right. great title. Um, so the artwork for the U.S. poster was done by a guy named C. Winston Taylor, um, who he had previously worked uh, with both MPM uh, and film concept group. Uh, he did Mausoleum, uh, the Guardian of Hell art, uh, and presumably, you know, given their connections, he's did the Gates of Hell and Night of the Zombies as well. Um, he was a nom vet. Uh, he got some bronze stars over there. Uh, and when he came back, he started doing, uh, you know, a bunch of art and eventually latched on to doing movie posters. Um, so he actually did The Swarm. Uh, he did Time After Time. He did Evil Speak. He did Beastmaster, uh, Demons 2, Joysticks. Lone Wolf McQuaid, um, Mutant Hunt, Robot Holocaust. Uh, he did an absolute ton of really badass posters. Um, he moved into comics. He did the Quantum Leap comic adaptations or comic series. Uh, and then I guess as that as you know the film poster and comic market kind of shrank, he started an electrician business in 1995. Uh, and you can find him on LinkedIn, uh, which is where I got some of that information from. Um, now, the U it was released in the UK, uh, but surprisingly, it wasn't a Video Nasty. It actually came out over there about a year after the Video Nasty situation happened. So it wasn't, there was no like pre cert copies of that that were getting rounded up. The UK release was missing a whopping 13 minutes, Jeez. which cuts that movie down to like fucking like nothing. Like what, like 72 minutes or something? Probably uh, less. So yeah, like all the pretty much all the gore was like hacked out like wholesale. I could I couldn't even imagine watching a move a version of this missing thirteen. Why minutes. bother? Right. Um, so yeah, from there it kind of went into uh, you know we we can talk about Vestron Video. Uh, they were the ones who licensed uh, several films uh, from this organization uh, for VHS. Um, do you want to talk about that yeah, for a bit, Art? Sure. So. To give the viewer an idea about, like, Vestron just was exploding around this time period, and to put it in context with some of the other big releases of theirs, um, Last House on the Left was first released by Vestron in a cut version in May of 1985, and then later in 1985, on December 11th, was when House on the Edge of the Park 
was first released by Vestron, and then it wasn't until June of 1986 that the unrated version of Last House on the Left was released by them. Burial Ground, I believe, was released on February 24th of 1986. Vestron was active from 1981 to 1982. They peaked out when they went into the theatrical business with Dirty Dancing. They came out on August 21st, 1987, just about a year and a half after they first released Burial Ground on video. So they had plenty of money to promote these titles, get them into video stores. The company was active from 1981 to 1992. It was founded in 1981 by Austin Owen Furst Jr., F-U-R-S-T Jr., he was an executive at HBO, and he was originally hired to dismantle the assets of Time Life Films. You might remember those Time Life books commercials back in the day. Time Life also had Time Life Films. And so Vestron was just hugely successful. This figure just blows my mind. At one point, they exceeded over 10% of what at the time was the giant market, the U.S. video market, to be over 10% of the U.S. video market, they were titans of home video. Yeah, for, for an indie compared to the majors, yeah, it's unbelievable. Right, right, and at their high point, sales approximated $350 million annually, and that's, you know, in 1985 numbers. Right. Um, they were a publicly traded company on the New York Stock Exchange beginning in 1985. The biggest success, of course, was Dirty Dancing, but... Were extended, they over expanded, and they came crashing down, ultimately filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. And they were bought out in early 1991. It was bought out by not by live entertainment. Most of their holdings are owned by Lionsgate today, which acquired Live's company Artisan Entertainment in 2003. Artisan, of course, being a huge indie of its own, that um, you know, released the Blair Witch Project, was probably their big hit. But um, it's just Vestron tapes were just everywhere. Yeah. And, you know, they released everything from the Richard Pryor concert films to mainstream comedies to a lot of exploitation stuff. But really, like, the idea, again, like, I just can't stand these, like, bullshit stories of, like, oh, I was scouring the dark depths of a mom and pop <laughs> video store to find this rare movie burial ground. Fuck you. Burial right. Ground had a mainstream theatrical U.S. release. It had a mainstream home video release. And by the time, you know, just a year after, year and a half after, Vestron had had dirty dancing money. They were sending glossy promo items out to every video store in the country. They were pushing their catalog. And that's why Burial Ground, who knows how many units were out there, but like huge number, huge, huge number. Um, yeah, and, and for all that money that they had, their tape of Burial Ground and Night of the Zombies still look like total dog shit. Uh, <laughs> uh, they don't, they don't, though. Like, they do and they don't. Like They're, I so, you, they're, they're so dark. They're very dark. On, like, on, on a the TV darkness today, is the only complaint. On yeah, a TV like, today, you can you can raise the brightness. When media, when media, no, I'm not saying that the tape looks good, but the fact that it was uncut the right. fact that it's a 16 millimeter 166 thing like when you looked at the seven doors of death tape you're looking at the bridge of people's noses when it zooms <laughs> in on eyes it looked ridiculous burial ground you got a feel for what the movie looked like yeah but it was watchable there, it was watchable there, which is which is better than most sometimes so honestly, there are there, there are whole chunks of that that like the scene with the the really dark the really scene dark. with the professor underground you can't even like barely see any of the zombies coming up to him uh, the scene where they're going around with in candlelight, like with the maid uh, or the other guy, the mustache guy, like you can barely tell what the hell's happening in any of those scenes. Um, so both that and Night of the Zombies were probably two of the worst looking Vestron tapes. Night of the Zombies, there's whole scenes in that too that are just like pitch black. Yeah, but like they had two of the best covers, so it made up. For right, it. right. All well, forgiven. look, and 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 so like people are talking, and rightfully so, about how we're living in a golden age now where there's all this amazing content coming out there's all this glorious high quality and but what's missing in that is 
unless you're Bruce Holacek or Dave Parker or Art Ettinger, like if we want to see a movie, we're going to watch the movie, even if it's reverting back to the days where we had to watch a shitty pal tape transfer, because we want to do our homework. We want to see the movie more then we want to see something that's high quality, you know, yeah, like I, if we're I, doing our research and we want, and so we became very well watched at this young age and people are like, Oh, why are people nostalgic for VHS? People are nostalgic for VHS because Scarecrow video has a greater title depth than streaming will ever have. You know, right, it's right. just like, like we, we, we lost something along the way and there was that brief time period. That's why Art Ettinger had to scour his things to find the <laughs> um, Undertaker because that movie emerged as a VHS bootleg in the era where everyone was watching DVDs. And so even though this super cool movie, five years earlier, if that had come out, everyone would have had a bootleg of it. At that time, you know, I'm like, wow, you know, like this Joe Spinell lost movies out. No one cared. They were like, I have a DVD player. Fuck you. I'm watching, you know, I'm watching a crisp new DVD. It's like, are you out of your mind? You don't want to see this thing that's like we've been waiting for all these years. So I don't know. I think um, I think that we are living in a golden age. Uh, So me, who was never happy with just getting bootlegs of stuff. I always like to have original copies. Um, One of the biggest coups I had in my personal burial ground history was the Japanese VHS release yeah I have that uh, too as, as Zombie 3 The Great Nights tape. of Terror um, and the big difference to this not only was it slightly letterboxed like it should be it was also so much brighter like all that darkness from uh, the Vestron tape was gone you could actually tell what was happening in the underground scene you could tell what was happening during the candlelight scenes uh, and funny enough the Japanese tape of Hell of the Living Dead, you know, their version of Night of the Zombies, was also the same. Like, it also looked so much better. So while the U.S. tapes were uncut, uh, they were could still be improved upon um, throughout the uh, international market. Um, I used to get my Japanese tapes from a guy named Yoshitomo Fuji, uh, who I am now friends with uh, on social media, which is really funny to me. Uh, and I used to have to mail him cash through the mail to Japan. Yeah. And then just wait like two months to get a tape back. Uh, it was like the craziest thing. I couldn't imagine people having like the, people not having that sort of control. So every time I had to see somebody crying about their like, oh my vinegar syndrome sales shipment, my Severn sales shipment, my slipcover is bent. Yeah, slip right, cover's yeah. Bent. I can't live with myself. I'm yeah, like, I'm just like, oh my god. Are you gonna watch it? Are you gonna right. watch the movie? It's gonna yeah, get bent. exactly. It's gonna get shelfware. If you're right. gonna watch it, it's gonna get fucked up a little bit. If you're not exactly. gonna watch it, then why are you buying it? Right. No, and then they complain about these companies, where it's like it's Amazon that's most likely to ship you something that's super dinged, you know? <laughs> like um, Damian Glonick runs Living Dead Dolls, and I was with him at his table, and, you know, occasionally he'll hear about people complaining about, like, you know, I ordered something from Amazon, it came fucked up. This guy ordered a Living Dead Doll from Amazon. They took just the pa- the doll in the package and slapped the guy's address label on it and just shipped it. <laughs> Like this, like expensive thing with like they just like that's how much they care, you know. Right, right. Whereas like like um, Severn cares so much. Like it takes six years to get through the packing peanuts, but thank thankfully those packing peanuts are there to keep your keep your Black every, Emanuel stuff safe. I'm, you know? I'm trying every, to make sure they don't fall on the fucking ground. Pulling exactly. Them up, right. Yeah. yeah. Every time. Every time. But it's but it's the way to do it. It's like um yeah. Se- Severn cares enough that they put. Burial Ground on 4K UHD. And Zombie Holocaust. And Zombie Holocaust. And a gentleman in the Severn Cellar once said (laughs) that Burial Ground is the greatest zombie movie of all time. That played very widely in the States, was available uncut on VHS forever and ever, and um, it's one of the gateway movies to Italian genre cinema for so many of us, and it is the greatest zombie movie of all time, according to yours truly. Art Ettinger of Ultimate Out Magazine. Thank you, Severin. Speaking like... of that, we should go on and compare it to other zombie films. Good you enough, because I am out of notes. So, uh, yes, I am 100% ready. You're also apparently out of razors. <laughs> <laughs> so, this will be quick, because if we ever do these on the show, you don't want to blow your entire your entire knowledge on it. But uh, better or worse? 
but okay. Euro zombie films that I think have some similarities to Burial Ground. All right, so and here's here, I'll be very curious to see how me and Art go in this. Whereas you know the last one I did on these it was me and Nathaniel, and we usually track like probably ninety five percent of the time. I feel like me and Art track like fifty percent of the time. We it's track like... a lot more than fifty percent <laughs> of the time. I, and I, if it wasn't for me. There would be say, no new kids in your life or cheerleaders say, wild weekend. I was gonna say two movies that Art has recommended to me that I will forever be grateful are Cheerleaders oh. Wild Weekend and the New Kids. New Kids uh, is excellent. Yeah, and I yeah. was a uh, Bruce will tell you I was an early adopter of both of those. I am yes. like yes. I've been talking about those movies forever, and I know. like and people wouldn't I mean, listen to me. Same thing with Weekend with the Babysitter. Right. No one wants to watch Weekend with the Babysitter. <laughs> it is the best. Yeah, I hear that. Me, uh, 70, 70 or six something. Exploitation or sex? Yeah, I think it's, 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 like, it's like a crown it's international. Strange. It's right. a strange. It's a strange. No, it's um, it's a um hippie exploitation movie. Okay, yeah. I yeah, have a. Strange. Uh, I actually, I actually own the photo negatives of that. All the promo photo negatives. Uh, you know, um, Rhino released a few versions of it, and one of them is way better than the others, and is like letterboxed and stuff. I'm surprised. No I'm surprised Vinegar Syndrome never did that from the uh, Crown International stuff. You would have thought they would have. Well, I'm the only fan of the movie. <laughs> so yeah, I've I've known Art for what, like 25 years now, or something ridiculous. Oh, more, um, yeah. Over, yeah, like 30, yeah. And literally, yeah, he's been talking about New Kids and uh, Cheerleaders Wild Weekend for pretty much that entire time. <coughs> I saw Cheerleaders Wild Weekend on um, USA Up all night, and then I immediately went and rented it. Like I didn't know it was in the comedy section, yeah. and it has this like, gee, I have it's it's too high up to reach. I have the. Um, <laughs> The Vestron, it's Vestron um, beta tape that I got sealed in new back in the day. Anyway, it's in mint shape, but it's on like this high up shelf I'd have to. Anyway, go ahead. All right, so first up, Tombs of the Blind Dead. Art? I'll go Art and then Bruce. Tombs uh, of the Blind Dead, Burial Ground, better or worse? Yeah, just say whichever one you like better. Burial Ground. Okay. I also agree that Burial Ground is better. I think Tombs of the Blind Dead, I love the Blind love. Dead scenes. Um, the movie's pacing is a little bit wonky and a little all over the place. I actually prefer this first sequel. Um, is probably my favorite of the series, the quartet. The I would go Burial Ground is, as well. The, the best named is Night of the Seagulls. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> this is a heavy hitter. Let Sleeping Corpses Lie. Fuck. Um, I'm going Sleeping Corpses. Burial Ground. Sleeping Corpses for me. Yeah, it's a, it's a better movie. It's a little, it's, it's, Yeah. I just Peter Mark doesn't bite a titty in it. He's right about that. Uh, well, te 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 a titty gets ripped off. Well, te the titty does get ripped off. And technically, doesn't the baby, one of the babies does bite a titty in that movie, doesn't he? They don't show it, it though. Right, but it, it Off screen happens. titty biting. It happens. <laughs> <laughs> That's like an off screen kill in a slasher. It's no good. Um, next up, <laughs> uh, zombie. Uh, zombie is, I think, better. That's burial tough, ground. though. Burial ground. Burial Ooh. ground. Okay. Uh, City of the Living Dead or Gates of Wait, Hell. Wait, you didn't. You didn't say, Dave. Zombie. I'm a zombie guy. It's my. That's like my fifth favorite movie ever made. <laughs> <laughs> well, and zo zombie has. <laughs> I mean, zombie has such a nostalgic charm to me about it too. That's like the first one I saw. Like the first real of this batch. You know, it's it's. I didn't rent Zombie when I was a kid because the photos on the back of the Wizard video box were in black and white. So I thought it was an <laughs> old. I thought it was an old movie. I didn't know that and cover was, was intimidating. Like, I know though, too. It's it just that <laughs> Lucio Fulci presents Val Luton's Zombie. <laughs> so yeah, it That's wasn't. Until, right. It wasn't until later. That, you know, I was like, I was probably like fourteen or so, fifteen when I saw it. And it is a life changer. Honestly, like I wouldn't be here talking about burial ground if I had not seen Zombie. So, okay. So, Gates of Hell. Um, Gates of Hell is probably better. I don't consider Gates of Hell a zombie movie. Um, it's the only one I can possibly consider out of the three as a zombie film because they do eat some flesh in it. No, I just like. But I've already gone on record saying that Burial Ground is the greatest zombie movie of all time. We strike it from the we strike it from the note then. It's not right, a zombie right. movie. It's eliminated. It's I mean, not I'll a zombie say, movie for I, you. 
I mean, I um, I I would say that I prefer Gates of Hell, but I I don't immediate. I don't, I'm not arguing that it's not a zombie movie because that's obnoxious, but it's not what I think of when I think of a zombie movie. It's not um, a zombie film first and foremost. No, it does get lumped in though with that whole sure run of, run of Fulci things. I but I gotta go Gates of Hell Fulci, myself. Yeah, me too. That's because Fulci became synonymous with zombies because of zombie but that doesn't make the anyway you're right yeah he only really had what the two zombie demonia is that, are they zombies in that it's hard to remember aren't they like they they're, just... de- they're like demonic nuns or something yeah yeah i don't remember as um, opposed to what nuns <laughs> <laughs> oh shit uh night of the zombies uh this burial is way ground. this is way better burial ground for sure um nightmare city I Aero like this. Ground. I like this better than Nightmare City. Nightmare City is kind of fun, though. Uh, yeah, definitely. Love them these both. All, but Burial Ground. I like all these better. movies. Yeah, I do too. I, I've not seen them. Um, here's a good one: Zombie Holocaust. Now, see, this is this is the one I knew was coming, and I don't even know how to go. I love both of these movies pretty equally. Uh, I think I might go Zombie Holocaust over Burial Ground. Are you talking uh, about Doctor Butcher, MD? Correct. Dr. Butcher. Well, that's two different cuts, I guess. And I, I actually, I prefer the Dr. Butcher MD cut. I like the music shorter, in it better. Yeah. It's streamlined. I like the funky opening, the whole Snuff Maximus bullshit. Um, yeah. Well, I, the I, zombie I, meeting, the, the yeah, the zombie cannibal meetup where he's like, <laughs> that's, that's like the greatest they, scene ever. They just keep walk, right. They just keep walking out of the woods. They keep walking out of the woods. That's and stand well. There it's and another one of those moments, right? I remember how that made me feel. I right? remember how that made me feel, and I was. I remember telling my friend the next day about it. I'm like, and he's like, Aah. oh god. Uh, yeah, of course I have to... that's a zombie movie, but I don't. Again, it's not what I think of when I think of yeah. zombie movies. Well, because you got mad scientists in it, and you got there's so yeah. much it, else. It's a can, can, cannibals in it. I so yeah, yeah I have to go Doctor Butcher. Just, yeah, like th- both Doctor Butcher and Barry Brown, like two of my all time favorite movies. Yeah, same. I'm gonna go with Doctor Butcher, but again. I still think at the end of this, I can say that Burial Ground's the greatest zombie movie of all time because it's like a prototypical like zombie heavy movie. Like right. to say that you know what I mean. Like they're like I'm not like oh recommend me a zombie movie. I'm not like yes it has zombie in the name zombie holocaust, but I'm like not gonna say Doctor Butcher MD when I think of zombie movies. Anyway, I I'm gonna go Burial Ground. I like them both. They're very close, but I gotta pick Burial Ground over it. Um, you know what? A lot of these they're listing I don't consider zombie movies, so I'm not even going to read them. I don't really. Erotic Nights of the Living Dead is a zombie movie, but man, it is not like this kind of zombie movie. Right, it is though. It is. It I is. Actually, but it is. I think I think the zombie scenes in Erotic Nights of the Living Dead are actually are some good. of the best. Are they're some of the best Euro zombie scenes there are? Um, I think Erotic Nights of the Living Dead is more of a zombie movie than Zombie Holocaust is. <laughs> they're at least they look you, like you, zombies. You, you might actually not be wrong <laughs> i think no i i mean yeah, it like yeah, yeah it sounds yeah. stupid because it's in the fucking yeah. names i but get that the zombie holocaust but, zombies are just medical experiments they're more like yeah, frankenstein monsters right, they don't really right. eat people no i yeah, like, right. i never it i has, never was like right. that's a zombie movie like i guess know, they're just like, frankensteins pretty much and then they got the cannibals around to eat the people and they're not even durable they're they're not durable so why the fuck's he wasting his goddamn time making weak ass I, yeah and they really don't do much. Like the one pops up to that dude on the beach with like a kn- he has a knife. He like pulls the knife out. He's, he's like, going after him, right? <laughs> just gets his face propellered. Uh, uh, yeah, they, they I always laugh like at that around. hysterically. When I when right. I start thinking, and I'm just like, I'm like Donald O'Brien. I'm like, why? Why are you doing this? Like, I don't <laughs> right. understand your motives for what you're doing. You're not doing anything. <laughs> it's it's absolute nonsense. So erotic nights. I'm gonna go burial ground. Yeah, I got Burial Ground, but I, I really like Erotic Nights. It took me yeah. fucking forever to get, like, the fact that we have, like, now a gorgeous uncut yeah, Erotic Nights of the Living Dead is insane because that movie was impossible in the VHS Hard. days to, to yeah. get co- I literally had, like, three different copies of it that each had, like, different shit. Like, the Japanese one was in English, but it was, like, missing a lot of the sex and everything else was, like, optically censored. You. Then there was, like, another one that had, there was, like, a French that had some hardcore footage but was missing some other stuff and wasn't in English. Then there was like an Italian print that looked terrible. It was like literally like somebody projected a 16 millimeter Italian print of it and like videotaped it off of a wall. <laughs> but that print had the hardcore in it. Uh, so the fact that like we can just, you can just now buy, well, it might be out of print now, but it's you, probably out there, print. right. There's a gorgeous looking Blu-ray of that movie. Just complete, just blows my mind. There's, there's, there are certain movies like, you know, 
uh, Fulci's Lizard and Woman's Skin was another one like that, where like if you wanted to see everything, you had to have multiple copies. Oh, what of, about like, Four Flies on Grey Velvet? Yeah, that was another big one, right? Right. Yeah, it was like it just impossible That's a recent to see. Release that just blew me away. Right. Okay, so oh, I didn't say, but I say Burial Ground, obviously. Yeah, I, I, um, we're gonna. I figured. I almost didn't even have to ask. Zombie Three. Uh, definitely Burial Ground. Zombie Three, like the later Zombie Three. Full cheese, Bruno Mattei, Zombie Three. Oh my God, are you kidding me? Burial Ground. Sorry, <laughs> I love oh, Zombie Three. Yeah, I, I was gonna like say. I, yeah, I don't hate it either. No, uh, but yeah, it's no Burial Ground. Beatrice <sighs> Ring is great. <laughs> I, I love Bear, uh, Zombie Three. I don't know. I'm, I'm coming close to a tie, but, but they're so different. One's like a they're fast-paced different. action movie, and one's like a slow burn nightmare. Right. They're hard to compare for me. I, I don't even think any of the other ones. The last great Italian zombie movie would be Cemetery Man, right? Yeah, which is funny because it, it is a zombie movie, but again, that's another one. It doesn't feel like a zombie movie. I mean, it almost. No. It's funny because you know Michele Suave, uh, you know. Early on, he had worked on. Uh, he did second unit for Terry Gilliam's The Adventures of Baron Munchausen. Um, yeah. And if you watch Cemetery Man, to me, that feels much more Terry Gilliam than it does Italian. It has art. a British sensibility, a British right. sense of comedy in it for sure. Mm -hmm. The absurd British comedy, no doubt. Uh, and then, like, if you look at the stuff with like the Grim Reaper and compare that to the Grim Reaper scenes in Baron Munchausen, they're like fucking identical. Uh, it's ridiculous. Some crossover there. I gotta pick Cemetery Man myself just because that's one of my top ten favorite horror movies. Um, God, they're so different. Um, Cemetery Man versus Burial Ground. You picked Cemetery Man. I couldn't help it. I grew up with it. I grew up with both of them. Actually, there are two yeah. movies I, I watched a lot growing up. Yeah, when I first got Cemetery Man, like I remember, I was waiting for that tape to come out. Like I, you know, I I, I couldn't wait. You know, I'd go in the video. Yeah, I got every... to see it in the theater, which was cool. Uh, I'm jealous. Oh, yeah. But yeah, I would because it was what ninety five, I think, when that hit. Yeah, and I was um, home from college, and it played the then dwindling Como Eight, which is the theater that showed Burial Ground when I was a little <laughs> kid. Uh, but yeah, I had to wait for the VHS. I remember every week I'd be like, "It's still coming, right?" Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I remember that Tuesday that it came out, uh, I went and rented it and literally watched it twice in a row. Like as soon as I finished, I just rewound it and watched it again. I was so blown away by it. I uh, recently had to research for something else I was writing when new release tuesday started and it was late it was like later than you think i think it's 88 or yeah i was something. gonna say yeah it. it wasn't in the 80s right yeah i have it's... it somewhere here i'm gonna look it up while we're continuing <laughs> so bruce um, what do you think i fuck they're so different uh cemetery man's probably the better movie but honestly in my life i've watched burial ground a lot more i know that's not an answer um it's I, an answer it's it, burial ground but if i was on an island and had to pick one i'd, I'd pick burial ground don't you have nightmares on that island? Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Give, keep you interested. <laughs> April of 1989 is when New Release Tuesday became an industry standard, which for me was the very last semester of middle school. Um, so until then, you'd have to like, you'd have to have your mom drive you to the video store every fucking day. Oh, yeah. They just, just put out whatever the Tuesday. fuck they wanted. Yeah, whenever. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. If it was eighty nine, April eighty nine. You said I would have yep. been, yeah, I would have been eleven. So I would been in my last semester of sixth grade. I would have been three. <laughs> but I remember going there. Um, some days you take off school, and I'd be there, or I was like not at school that day, and my grandpa had to watch me, and he used to go every Tuesday, right, and sit That's and wait awesome. for him to open yep. with all the other old guys, and then they'd open the doors, and he'd run up there and start grabbing all the tapes and shit because he was the uh, he used to record everything and give them out. My grandpa was a king bootlegger. <laughs> free, though. He didn't charge anybody. He gave him away for free. Your granddad sold me my first copy of Rock Knights of the Living Dead. <laughs> my grandpa never heard of that movie. But he did record <laughs> me Zombie Lake, and he handed it to my mom when I was like 10. He was like, yeah, I don't know if you want to give that to him. <laughs> like, that was pretty rough. <laughs> was a yeah, that, that, one gets, that one gets real gynecological real quick. Like yeah, the, the underwater, underwater skinny dip. Yeah, right? That's what he was like. My grandpa was like, Holy shit! Watched it. You know, I watched it like four or five times. Yeah, it's funny. Somewhere around here, uh, I have a uh, my buddy Neil Vokes, comic book artist Neil Vokes, actually made me a watercolor of a, a, a zombie lake skinny dipper and like these zombies and stuff underwater. I'll see if I can dig that out and send you a picture of it. Uh, it was a real nice gift from him. So I think we hit all the zombie movies that I was wanted to talk about. I mean, there's the other Blind Dead films, but do any of those yeah. three Blind Dead films? And then films... The, the weird Fulci stuff, right? Like, uh, Freudstein's not really a zombie. He's kind yeah, of we just, don't... He's eternally we living. 
We don't right. think House, House by the Cemetery is a zombie film. Right. The Beyond has zombies in it, but it's not really a zombie film. Right. So, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Any, yeah, I think. Any last words on it, on Burial Ground? Um, no, just it, it was nice to be able to come on here and talk about it and hopefully defend it, you know, against some of these uh, so bad it's good people. And hopefully, you know, people will watch it and appreciate it for what it is, which is really just this kind of bizarre, funky, nightmarish thing that just lurches along till it fucking kills everybody. It's just such a fun movie. It's just, it's pure movie magic. It's why I like movies is movies like Burial Ground. And, you know, I, I'm a cinephile. I watch all kinds of movies. I'm not just a genre guy. I'm really not. I, I watch a lot of new movies. I keep up and, you know, I watch Oscar bait. I watch Art House Fair. And, but, man, like, this is what gets me going. Right. This is my, this is my lane here. For sure. I, I quite enjoy it myself. I appreciate you guys coming on. If you have any plugs or anything you guys want to talk about before we head out of here. Um, just looking for more commentaries with Bruce and I. Yes. Yeah, I guess our, our running kill should be shipping sometime really soon. Uh, at some point, we're doing Red the Kill. Uh, and then more episodes of this show as well. Uh, follow us on... You can follow me on uh, Instagram, Cinema Arcana, or Letterboxd, or Facebook, or whatever. Art, you good? I'm good. You can watch for a new issue of Ultra Violence sometime this millennium. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> See you guys. Thanks right. again. Thanks, Always Dave. a pleasure, Dave. Always. <laughs>